It's me again, Scott. So I'm very happy to speak with you and to cover the part two of Romans chapter eight. And uh, we're gonna cover verses 18 through 28 tonight. And as Bobby mentioned last time, you could spend a lot of time going through Romans 8, and I'm uh, trying my best to make it as sort of rapid pace as one can do with Romans 8. Um, last time we covered a lot of things, and I'm going to do a quick review so that we kind of know where we've, where we've been. Um, so we talked about really so many things. So what's the problem? The problem of sin and how do how is sin dealt with and that was what Paul was talking about and God's plan for it and we talked about how we had freedom because of what God was able to do not because of the law because Paul said the law couldn't do it it was powerless it was weak and what it couldn't do God did and God made a plan for freedom and so we talked about freedom from the law and freedom from punishment and that Jesus became the perfect sacrifice. And then we talked a lot about the work of the Holy Spirit, which is huge in Romans 8 as we went through. And there's more information. I think Alan mentioned this last time. There's more information about the Holy Spirit and what it actually does in the life of the believer uh, than in any other book in the Bible. So we talked about several things, the work of the Holy Spirit. That it actually, he, he, the Holy Spirit, that will be mentioned tonight, um, frees us from punishment. He dwells in us, quickens our mortal bodies. That means makes us alive, ready for the resurrection. Helps put to death the sins of our body. Leads us and enables us to call God, Abba, Father. The close Paul of a child. And the Holy Spirit testifies with our human spirit to our glorification. And so that was a lot of information, right? And um, one important thing to note, it, it's not as if the Holy Spirit is how some people sensationalize it, right? The work of the Holy Spirit inside us is not measurable in any means that we can see on a human scale, right? We can't feel it overpower us because that's not what the Holy Spirit does. It does not work to overpower our own human spirit, but yet it works inside us and works with us. And so it was really um, a, a, a great study and a reminder of the Holy Spirit. What do we talk about as well? that we need a spirit-filled mindset. Paul spent a lot of time talking about the mindset of the Christian. And this is one thing that, that reminds us that the Holy Spirit is not going to grab you and say, hey, you're going to think good thoughts now, like magic, right? That's not how it's going to work. It's not going to come over us. We have a part to play, and that is being mindful of Christ-like things as we work in our process of purification, the process of sanctification, and Christ-like actions. So, in many ways, this is not like a phrase that we've all heard, you know, let go and let God. It's not quite like that in this sense, because we have a part to play. We have to be mindful of the right attitude and then in that, the Holy Spirit can support us and help us be even um, more successful at that. So those were the things that we talked about. And also the Holy Spirit is always there to help us, which is a big part of our focus tonight. I'm going to pick up. Oh, sorry. So I've titled this, and you may have seen this before because I found this like a hundred times online. Um, because the words we're going to talk about tonight talk about suffering. And depending on your versions, and I use the New American Standard, the New American Standard says groaning. And we're going to talk about groaning a lot. That's a word that I don't actually say all that often. But tonight, the title of the lesson, as fabulous as it is, a title from groaning 
to glory. And that will make sense as soon as we start and get to chapter, uh, verse 18. Let's first begin with verse 16 to uh, pick up at the end of the study last time. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may be glorified with him. Moving right into verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we've been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. Sorry for kind of a long reading, but I'm trying to um, help us kind of get a, uh, an idea of where we're going here tonight. So Paul starts with the discussion of sufferings, and he talks about the sufferings of this present time. And through all of this, Paul's mentioned the, the humanity that we understand, the fact that decay has to happen, that we live in a world full of it, that we are in a body that can't last forever, even for the believer, right? We're given a promise of a future redemption of our body, but in the human uh, realm as it is, it's limited. And so still, we have sufferings in this present time. But Paul says they're not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed. And that's an awesome comparison. And I want to talk about that for a second because I realize that the language is so interesting. Our sufferings are not worth comparing. And I might use a different analogy if I were saying it right. I would say, hey, your sufferings are something, but at least you get a great reward. And so in saying it like that, which I probably would, that sort of says, hey, your sufferings are something, but the glory is greater. But Paul is making such a great comparison as to say, your sufferings are are not even on the same uh, uh, realm of comparing. And I read an analogy that said it like this. Imagine if you had a scale, and on one side was your sufferings, and on the other side was glory. You could mount all of human suffering on one side with all the pain and all the sadness and all the hurt and all the embarrassment and everything that possibly happened. And it would still account to zero in comparison to the great glory on the other side of the scale. And that's that's something that what, what Paul is trying to get at, get at. Now at the same time, he's not saying suffering is nothing, right? He's not unfeeling. And Paul, of all people, knows that suffering is real. We'll talk about it later, but he even prays for some relief from 
suffering. So Paul is just trying to emphasize the great scale, the unbelievable scale of the glory that's provided to us in God's plan. The glory that is given to us in collaboration with the Holy Spirit that helps us and works in us. We have an amazing glory that Paul continually reminds us of through this chapter. Let's read verse 19 through 22. It's really interesting. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth until now. This is actually a tough set of verses, and I read this in like 20 translations um, trying to, you know, find some, some um, alternative means, and I'll discuss that here. The discussion, of course, is clear in one sense, right? There's suffering and a longing. There is a setting free from a current groaning, and we see that in all the words that Paul's using here, and a future uh, view to glory. However, the real application of this centers around the word creation. And it's very interesting. The word is katisis in the Greek, and it's used uh, around, let's see, four times in Romans 8, right here in these verses, and 19 times in the New Testament. And what's interesting about it, and what helps us interpret this passage is that, and I borrowed this from someone, this is not my research here, this is great though, it says depending on context, katisis can mean all these things. It can mean everything created by God. It can mean an individual creature. It can mean humans or animals or any creative thing. It can mean humankind collectively. It can mean humans transformed by God through the new birth. It can mean the active creation, and it can mean the authoritative institution or government. So then what does that mean? Well, as we, as we know, we have to then read it in context. That's what we have to do. So, so let's look at it. What can it not mean? That helps me sometimes. What can it not mean? We know that some things are created like angels, their creation, but they weren't subjected to futility. Demons won't be redeemed or set free like in verse 21. So it's not angels or it's not demons. Unbelievers don't have the longing of the revealing of the sons of God, nor will unbelievers be set free, verse 21. So while creation can be interpreted as all of those and is used throughout the New Testament as all of those, in context, it can't be all of those. So I admit that actually through my mental lens, when I read this, I was I was really thinking, I was like, man, Paul is is using language here to talk specifically about the earth and the animals and everything that we know is cursed in the fall, right? Cursed in the curse because of Adam. And that's how I was reading it and, and have read it before, admittedly. I think about that curse every time I'm picking weeds and I poke myself with a thorn and I'm like, Adam. But that's not what Paul is actually doing here. He's not really switching from believers' redemption and going to creation in a full sense. And in fact, there's, there's kind of a dangerous thing about that because... If you read it through the lens of, of redeemed earth, then you do get redirected into a thought of premillennialism, where there's a thousand year reign of Christ, where all of a sudden the earth is fixed and the curse is gone. That's not what the Bible says. What does the Bible say about the earth? 
sadly, it's destroyed. And I've had a picture before of a destroyed earth. I don't have it on this uh, slideshow tonight. But what do we know? Second Peter 3.21, the, after the, the day of the Lord, the earth is basically evaporated in fervent heat. And all of the elements and everything passes away. That is the destiny of the earth. And so perhaps in some ways, it groans and suffers, it does, because the earth is cursed by God because of the fall. That's true. But it doesn't get redeemed. These verses are not about a redeemed earth. They're not about redeemed plants. So by context, it leaves the only obvious conclusion that Paul is reminding us that believers have hope. And so how can we better read it? I have um, proposed a way that we could read this, and I'm open to others' input, but it could be interpreted like this, where the anxious longing of the believer waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For mankind was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected in hope that the believer will be set free from slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth until now. Perhaps that, that helps in a way to look at it, but again, it's all the same Greek word, kataisis here, um, and I'm open to comments. So what do we know? It's a focus on the believer. It's the focus of redemption, the redemption of our bodies, the focus on the, the real ultimate future for us. Paul has mentioned at length how we were subjected to futility. We know about it. We talk about it all the time. Adam's sin. We didn't want him to sin, but we're subjected to it. It's not what we would have liked. We wouldn't have preferred to live in a world that's fallen, but we do. We do, and, and so we thus groan. A verse similar to this is 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Also written by Paul, of course. So we're subjected to this futility. We're in a world that's fallen. I remember sort of the first time that we had to tell our kids, we're like, this is, this is what the world is in this way. Not everyone is nice. And in fact, you know, most people aren't. And, and, and humans are inclined towards sin. And that's the world that we live in. We live in a constant world of imperfection and a constant world of, of dying. That's the slavery to corruption that Paul also mentions. I mentioned it last time, but it's something that can't be avoided. We might live 60, 90, uh, 101 years, right? But we're not going to live a million years in this body. We are slaves to corruption no matter how long we live. Uh, Cambria corrected me after my last lesson because I said, all of us will die. And she's like, well, not if Jesus comes. And I'm like, that's true. So... Come, Lord, quickly. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. That's what we want. There is the chance that we might make it without dying, but the uh, perhaps the greater chance is that we will. All end in this way. We will live and our bodies will decay. That's what will happen. We're in a world of dying right now. So the focus is on the glory that is to be revealed. Verse 22 um, I'm missing one slide here, but I was going to go back and look at 22. That, again, may certainly mean that the whole creation truly does groan. That's true. The, the world is cursed. It, the uh, plants are cursed and all this. Also, with the heat waves we've had lately, we're that other part of the curse where we're going to work and sweat. I, I feel that all the time as well. So we get the idea, don't we? Things will be better in eternity. 
they'll be better in our redeemed bodies. Verse 23, the hope of redemption. Paul's constantly pointing at this, the hope of redemption. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we've been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. Paul brings the focus back to the believers, contrasting with the whole creation in verse 22, and brings us back to the Holy Spirit, the first fruits of the Spirit. It's great. This is the, the phrase here, which we're familiar with. We also heard the phrase first fruits in verses 9 through 11 of the same chapter, where the Spirit dwells in us, and the fact that it enlivens our bodies is a, is a first fruit fruit. This first fruit phrase um, goes back, of course, to the Old Testament where, you know, God owns all creation, obviously, but there were offerings of first fruits, a first portion. And what does it do? It shows that there's a sign of more to come. And that's what this means. And the time we talked about last time, the first fruits of the Spirit is a reflection of our redemption body, and the same is true here. This is very similar to 1 Corinthians 15, 20, which says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Again, another sign about first fruits, this time through Jesus' bury, uh, burial and resurrection, um, and how we will also be resurrected. So Paul is saying in clear terms, we have the Spirit of God in us as a sign of things to come in the first fruits. And what does it do? It gives us reason for our hope. For in hope, we've been saved. Hope is obviously looking forward to something with confidence, and this is not a mere thin hope. This is not, I hope um, OU beats Texas this weekend, right? This is not a uh, hope that I hope this cold front means it's finally fall in Oklahoma, right? This is based on the knowledge of everything we've studied thus far, our relationship with God, hope tied to our relationship with God, hope tied to everything that we've learned about that the Holy Spirit does within us, hope of our redeemed body, and our life in heaven, our eternal life in heaven. And borrowing from a concept later in this chapter, we have hope that no external force can rob you of salvation. That's true. We have hope that no matter what sickness we might get, you can't get so sick that your salvation will be taken from you. No external force can do that. And we'll talk about that in the last part of chapter eight, which I, uh, God willing, I'll, I'll cover on Sunday morning. So we have so much hope. And that's what Paul's pointing at here. The spirit-filled, truly converted believer has these things to hope for, and they are real and meaningful. As we move into the last part here, the New American Standard titles this portion, Our Victory in Christ. And of course, that covers from verse 26 to verse 39, the, the last verse of the chapter. And they're amazing verses that all support the idea of our victory. Let's read the last few here. <clears throat> in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness for we do not know how to pray as we should but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words for he who searches the hearts 
knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Paul begins here with another reminder of the work of the Holy Spirit. And this is the last mention in Romans 8 of the work of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to pay a lot of attention to it. It's huge. It's very important. We've, we covered many in the first part, but we're going to uh, cover the last one here in the role of the Holy Spirit's work in humanity. And what does it do? It helps us in our weakness and specifically in our prayer that we're going to talk about. You know, I, I heard a, um, a, an analogy basically about how the, the work of all of these things um, is fully Trinitarian, and there's almost no chapter that talks about the work of the Trinity, God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as much as is talked about in Romans 8. And so this thing that I heard says, God made the plan. Jesus made the plan possible, and the Holy Spirit makes it practicable. The assistance of the Holy Spirit. So you can take that for what it's worth. But in the first sentence of this section, Paul says the Spirit helps our weakness because we don't know how to pray. Or, or we know how to pray, but we don't know how to pray as we should. And we've all been in those situations under, under great and heavy circumstances where we cannot quite articulate what is really needed they, you know, I was thinking about myself. I pray um, at the house, you know, every day at meals and all of that. And I'm sure that even though I try to make them sound different, maybe from time to time, they probably end up sounding kind of similar each time, even though I try. So do I really think that I pray and say the right words every time? No. Do I really know what I should pray for? I think the King James Version says, what you ought. Do I know what I ought to pray for? No, not all the time. Um, you know more clear than I do, perhaps, that sometimes we aren't sure to pray if someone should be healed or if someone should, if the better thing is that God takes them home. That is a, a great challenge. We, we don't know exactly what we should always pray for. Should we pray that this job works out? Or should we pray that it doesn't, so maybe another better one comes along? Should we pray that our kids don't have struggles? Or pray that they have struggles so they learn from them and are better, right? There's so many ways you could look at this. But the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. Even Paul prayed for release from the, the thorn in the flesh. But God said, my grace is sufficient for you. You see, we don't always know exactly what we should pray for. Interestingly, this is the third time in this chapter that groans are mentioned or groanings here. Um, first it was creation, groaning. Then the believer groans awaiting for redemption, right? And here we have groanings too deep for words. The Greek interlinear says, but himself the spirit makes intercession with groanings inexpressible. The word for groanings uh, appears over 50 times in the New Testament and is typically, and the majority of it, is human groanings. Okay, most of the time, that's what it is. And even here in context, we are talking about what? Us, believers groaning, creation groaning, mankind groaning. We don't know how to pray. This could also be our groaning. Unfortunately, it is not as clear as just saying, oh, that's definitely the Holy Spirit groaning, or that's definitely us groaning. So there's a little bit of 
of gray area here. I found a great commentator that says, it's not impossible, though, that there may be a blending of two thoughts. Some think that the groanings, though originating with the Christian, actually are shared by the Holy Spirit and the believer. Another one says, uh, John Stott suggests that the Holy Spirit identifies with our groans so that we and he groan together. One thing is certain when the groanings reach God, they are perfectly clear to him. So either way, whether the groanings are the Holy Spirit or whether the groanings are us, they get heard by God. They get heard clearly by God. And as a side note, this doesn't conflict with Jesus' role in prayer. Jesus is always interceding for us. He is our mediator. And this is just something else that the Holy Spirit also helps with. Verse 27, And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. He who searches the hearts, I think this is such a great phrase. It's a phrase for God the Father. He's the heart searcher, if you will. God the Father is the heart searcher. In these times of difficulty, suffering, that is the subject of the study tonight, God deeply looks into our hearts and searches our mind. He knows our yearnings. He knows our needs. And he works directly with the Holy Spirit for what is needed. The idea of God searching the hearts is, of course, not new. Jeremiah 17, 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the hearts. Again, this reinforces the previous discussion that we don't always know what we need. And so it's helpful to know that God searches the heart and the Holy Spirit helps us in our prayers. What amazing blessings. This ties to the last verse that I want to cover tonight, verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to to his purpose. You know one interesting thing about this? <clears throat> this is, um, I mean, unsurprisingly, one of the most uh, searched online verses um, that, that exists. This is somewhere between third and eighth most, most popular verse that gets searched online. People search for this about 30 times a month, it turns out. And I think it's really interesting. We know that all things work out for those who love God, work out for good. Well, why is that? I think you know why. It's probably not 30,000 people either. It's probably 6,000 people searching it five times. Because they're looking at it and saying, how, how, is, how is that real? doesn't always feel like things are working out for good. You know, sickness is not good. Murder is not good. Death is not good. All of these things aren't good. How is this possible? That for those who love God, all things work out for good. Cancer is not good. There's so many things in the world that are part of the fallen world. They're part of our suffering that in and of themselves aren't good. So I think we know that the focus of this is something other than that, but that is often what people are seeking in their, in their lives, right? So what is the real point of this? What's the point of, of this section of Scripture from groaning to glory, from suffering to glory? Well, notice that, you know, Paul isn't necessarily talking about this life. Paul's not saying... You know what? For Christi Christians, it's going to be easy. No worries. From now on, you're all good. 
Paul's not saying Christians won't have difficulty. And as I mentioned before, he's not saying that your pain isn't real. No, he's just saying, for those who love God, all things work together for good. The NIV says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. So without oversimplifying it, we're simply talking about we live in a world, a fallen world, where evil exists. But Paul's vision for us is beyond that. And God's vision for us and his working for us is to the greatest possible good. That is our eternal good. That's what we're talking about here. There are uh, times where God also works, and we know this, there's verses that tell us this, there is good to be found in our human lives. Uh, we know that uh, Joseph, when his brothers threw him in the pit, and left him for dead, and then years later, I'm not sure exactly, 20 years, something like that, um, he tells them this, he says, you know what you did, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God works in the world, and we should never doubt that. God works in the world and will work out things for our good in this world. That's true. But I don't want us to think that when we read this verse that everything is actually good, because not everything is actually good. The major focus of this is what Paul says, um, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory to be revealed. And that's the focus. This life is not always going to be good, but the eternal life promise is the greatest possible good, more good than we could ever imagine. So another verse that says what it can help with is James 1, verse 2 through 4, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So suffering in life, it will be and may be painful, but are there lessons that we can learn? Absolutely. We can strengthen our, ourselves and be made more perfect. We can strengthen others who are maybe going through the thing that we have gone through and we can empathize with them. I think it was Gary who mentioned that recently. Um, we can empathize with people. We can help them and support them when they are going through the same things. So with God's help and walking by the Spirit, walking with a Christian mindset, letting the Spirit work in us, we can understand this, this future vision, this fact that we have a greater glory to be revealed. Looking forward to our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, and the life in the new heaven and the new earth. That's where our focus should be, and that's what Paul is talking about here. In conclusion, here are the things we've covered. We talked about the incomparable value of the glory to be revealed. We talk about how we long for the revealing of the sons of God, for the redemption of our bodies. We talked about how creation groans in the many ways that we discussed. Creation groans. We talked about hope because of the first fruits. We have hope because it is real. We have the Holy Spirit's assistance in our prayer because we don't know what we should pray for. And we talked about how God works for our greatest good. Those are the things we talked about tonight. And um, at this time, I'll open it up for any comments. David? Appreciate it. Thoughts <clears throat> very much. I particularly appreciated you going into and explaining the word creation and its and its context there, uh, because so many people do 
get off on this doctrine of, of the new earth. And it can be very confusing, but it, it's not that complicated. And you brought out that you know, the earth is going to be burned up by fire. And uh, you know, another easy thing uh, to remember and, and make a note, you can always uh, go to uh, John the 14th chapter in verses 1 and 2. And where Jesus is speaking, and he said, In my Father's house are many rooms or many mansions. And he said, I go to prepare a place for you. But how's he gone to prepare a place for us if it's not even going to exist until he comes back and be recreated? And then verse 3 goes on, and he says, uh, I go to prepare a place for you. Uh, so where I go, you may come and, and be with me also. So he gives the indication that he's already there. He's already re preparing the place we will go, and he's going to come back to get us, to take us to be with him. So this whole concept of the earth being renewed, just it just does not uh, coincide and harmonize with so many other things in Scripture. Uh, but that seems to be on the rise right now. I have a lot of, a lot of uh, talk and discussion uh, right. going around even some of the church that I've heard as a recent... Uh, Entertaining these type of thoughts and ideas, and uh, we need to we need to understand that. And I appreciate you bringing that out very much. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's huge, and I I did a lot of research. Um, now I know one percent of what Bobby knows about premillennialism, but um, the you know when you do research and say, well, at what point you know is is the new heaven and earth occur in the timeline, or what is the the uh, Earth reborn, and like, well, we're not really sure, but it happens somewhere in there. So there's there's all kinds of it, it just casts doubt on that belief, obviously. So anyway, I was trying to figure it out to portray it the best I could. So. Anybody else? Okay. All right. And they begin. I might one more comment. Yeah. Uh, at the end, uh, where you're talking in verse, which verse is it? Uh, verse 28, know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God. To me, when he's saying this, he's not talking about all things in general, everything that happens in life. He's talking about what he's talked about in this context of this chapter of, of, of this rebirth and this groaning and the suffering of creation and things being made new that we can't see yet, but yet we will see. All of those, the whole plan of this happening right now and the suffering and groaning, it's all for the good of those who do what God wants him to do. I don't think it's talking about every bad thing that happens in life uh, because I think we get, we fall into a trap when we do that because people want to say everything that happens, whether it's good or bad, is God's will. And that, that's not the case because people don't always do God's will. And Satan certainly doesn't do God's will. And bad things happen. And every time a bad thing happens, you can't just say, well, it was God's will. You know, and use this verse and say, but it's all going to work out good because it must have been God's will. That's, that's a misapplication of this verse to I think we have to look at it in the context of what the actions and stuff at the end of this chapter, this whole idea of suffering and, and the rebirth of mankind spiritually into that uh, eternal state. All of this happening is going to work to the good of mankind. And not, don't fall into the trap of thinking you know, everything that happens is God's will, whether it's good or bad, and I just not to. You know, I gotta, I gotta look for the good in it and say, you know, because sometimes God does use bad things, and sometimes it might be God's will, but we can't justify every bad thing by saying it's God's will. So. I agree. Okay. Uh, yeah. I think sometimes we get too caught up in the physical world that we live in. The car, car, carnal thinking um, when he says all things work together for good 
doesn't mean all physical things work together for good. Although, if we can work them to our good, regardless of how good or bad they may be, because when we pray for patience, he doesn't give it to us just as a snap of a finger. He teaches us patience, right? When we ask for endurance, he doesn't snap his fingers and grant it or wisdom or anything else. He teaches us these things through these trials, through whatever bad thing might happen. And I think sometimes we are so focused on, uh, for lack of a better term, the matrix, uh, that we are, we are so focused on what we can feel, what we can taste, what we can touch, that we are so detached from the real world, which is the spiritual realm that we were intended for. Uh, we were created as spiritual beings, not this group matter. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. It's a hard vision to have. You yeah. know, I agree. So, thank you. All right, so um, if there's no other comments, I'll offer a quick invitation. Um, and I appreciate all the comments. All of those are so true. You know, the, um, the great point of what Paul is trying to say here is look to the, the greatest good. Look to the eternal life that we have a chance to have. And it's true. We get weighed down by carnality and we get weighed down by the uh, mortal uh, life we do. And we look at those things, which is why Paul says, don't think about that. Think about spiritual things. Have a spiritual mindset. And if we can do that, then we can properly, right, let the Holy Spirit work within us. So tonight, um, you know, as, as we've gone through this, we haven't necessarily talked about the, um, the initial plan of salvation, but I hope that you can see if you are not a baptized believer, there is every blessing for your life as a believer, and there are no blessings for the unbeliever. The only destiny for the unbeliever is destruction, sadly, and that is, that is it, eternal destruction. Um, and so um, tonight, if you're in need of that, I would welcome you to come forward, try to make your life right, to follow these things we've talked about, to believe in the, the words we discussed that Paul is trying to tell us about so we can look to the future, um, confess Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Also, if there are any other uh, people, believers who need the prayers of the church for any reason, welcome you to come forward at this time.